up on this week's Outdoor Elements. Hi, I'm Evie Kirkwood from St. Joseph County Parks. And I'm Vince Gresham from the Cardinal Native Plant Nursery. On today's Outdoor Elements, we'll get to meet a fox snake up close. And we'll go to a wetland to learn about aquatic mammals. But first, we'll learn about elderberry and its historical medicinal uses. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. We're here at Cardinal Native Plant Nursery where there are all kinds of native plants and a lot of them have some really interesting uses. We're here with Sarah Tabner who's going to tell us about some of those uses in a, in a particular plant called elderberry. What can you tell us about elderberry? Well elderberry has a long historical use uh, for uh, indicated in colds and flus. So the berries are uh, prepared into syrups and uh, that is used for cold and flu symptoms such as uh, sore throats, mus uh, achy muscles and joints, uh, high fevers, things like that. And we've got some right behind us here, so uh, there's a lot of different plants out here. How do we tell elderberry from some of the other things that are out here? Sure. So what we're looking at is uh, right here, Sambucus canadensis. It has the dark, deep purple berries. So that's and its Latin name, Sambucus yes. canadensis? Mm-hmm. And so some of the identifying characteristics are uh, it has a compound leaf, so this is leaflets on one leaf, and the leaves are finely toothed, and they are arranged in an opposite way. And then the, uh, what is now the berry cluster was once a flower cluster of white flowers. And so it's a flat top cluster, and they turn when they're ripe, when they're ready to use or to harvest, they turn this nice, deep purple color. Yeah, they look like they're just about ready, don't yes. they? And, and I know great. we also have pokeweed growing out here, and sometimes yes. people can confuse those. So those are a little bit bigger. You always, yes. if you're using any kind of na native plant for anything like this, you want to make sure that you're making it expert identification on it before you use it for anything. Absolutely. We wouldn't want to use pokeweed for this. Yes, step one is making sure that you're um, collecting the right plant. So good identification skills are uh, step one in any type of medicine making. What kind of habitat do we normally find elderberry growing? Elderberry is somewhat tolerant. Uh, you can find it in moist wetlands, stream banks, river or roadsides, places like that. So if there's some sort of um, a water source nearby. Okay. So we have this stem here and a lot of people are curious about propagating this plant. It's really it's pretty simple to get this going, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, uh, collected in the winter months, yep. uh, you would be able to put that right in the ground. So it can and head right in the ground. Exactly. There. So Brilliant. basically just trim off all the leaves, the stems, yep. and stuff so it in there. It the yep. So we're going to find out more about how to use this plant. So we're going to head up to the kitchen. You're going to show us a few things. Yes. So this bottle says elderberry syrup, and that's what we're going to make with yes. Sarah here. Uh, this is a medicinal syrup, right? Yes. And it's not like a sweet pancake syrup, right? No, it's to be used for colds and flus, medicinal syrup. Okay, all right. Well, um, I'm going to kind of set this aside. So you've got some of the elderberries here that you've collected. What can you tell us about the collection of it? Sure, so there's a couple different uh, things to show here. This has a majority of the deep purple berries, so this is something you would want to collect. This still has a lot of those uh, more crimson or green berries, and these are not ripe yet. Uh, those do contain um, a toxin, so we don't want to collect something like that, and majority just this. So now and that we have them, can you walk us through the steps? How do we get it from this to this? Yes. Sure. So we're going to uh, take uh, by hand, clean from the berries from the plant material, so that's a little time consuming. And I noticed you're wearing gloves. Is that because you, it stains? It does. It can stain your fingertips, but it's also just to keep the uh, sanitary environment. Okay. Because when you're bottling things, you want things to be nice and clean. So yes, we'll have the berries separated. This gives us an opportunity to pick out any of those green berries or other stems or plant material that got into our, uh, into our berries. We would rinse them uh, a few different times. 
The nice thing about letting them soak for a few minutes is a lot of those green berries that you may have missed yep. will Looks like they're rise kind of to the top. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the other plant material. So then you can just pour that off, yeah. do a few different rinses, a little more cleaning up. And these are the discarded stems. We could just compost those, yep, right? Yep, we just compost those. Okay, so we're actually going to cook this. Yes. Can you eat these raw? Uh, that is not recommended. Okay. Uh, when you cook the elderberry, uh, it rids the seeds of a toxin that's okay. present. All right. So we'll head over All to right. the stove and see the, about the next steps, right? Ooh, it's steaming. Yes. Yeah. So now we're cooking them down. Uh, we add uh, some culinary herbs for flavor and also some additional medicinal value. So we have clove and cinnamon. Okay, and so you're kind of maximizing the benefit there of the extra herbs or spices in there. Right? Exactly. Right. And so this will be brought to a boil and it'll be cooked down to about half the amount of liquid uh, over the course of about 45 minutes. And then once that is done, we will mash it with a masher to get all of our constituents out into the liquid and we will then strain it. Okay, all right, and then we head over to bottling, right? Yes. Okay, and adding a couple of more things, so let's learn about those steps right. next. So we just boil it down, now yes. we need to strain it out, and there are a few other steps here, and a few additives that we have. Yes, might. so once we have things boiled down and mashed, there's different uh, filtering methods that we can use. There's a mesh strainer here as an example. It filters out the berries you can see. There's a coffee filter into a jar. It kind of depends on what you have at home. Mm. Uh, there's different options available. Once that's filtered, we're going to add some brandy and honey as preservatives and flavors. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And you have to re the heat, heat yes. it up again, right? Okay. You reheat right. that slightly. Don't cook off the alcohol, but just reheat it so it mixes. And then what we would do with that liquid from the pot is we use a mechanism to put it into a bottle and label it and it is ready to use. Okay. So are we ready to try some or yes. are we? Okay, we're get, like, we're, it's ready? It's ready. Because you it's made ready. this All earlier, right? right? Yes. Okay, right. so this was, it's not, this was made last does it night. have to sit for a while before? It doesn't, once it's prepared, once it's really? cooled down, it's ready to consume. Okay. And then once you, you have it bottled, it, the shelf life, it'll last a little while or? Yes, if you were to just use honey, which is kind of a children's version that would last maybe um, three to four weeks in a fridge, but by adding brandy, that gives it a shelf life of approximately six months. Okay. So of course, with anything like this, that's kind of a medicinal herbal, it's uh, good to do your research. Absolutely. If you want to consult a physician, yes. right? If you um, are hesitant about trying something like this, it smells really good. Like really fruity. I've had elderberry jam, but I haven't had this syrup. And all the good so stuff I'm, is in jams, yeah. pies, breads, yes. right? I mean, all the good nutrients. Yep, all the antioxidants and nutrients are in those things as well. Uh, but this is concentrated down, uh, so it has a little bit of an extra punch. It's wow. actually really that good. That is much better than I expected it to be. <laughs> it's actually really wow. tasty. Yes. That's really good. It's really good. Okay. So, uh, as you have mentioned, historically, folks used this to treat colds, flu symptoms. Yes, exactly. Because of those great antioxidants. Yes, and it has some other actions where it increases some certain molecules within the body to fight against virus and bacteria infection. So uh, outside of the antioxidants, it has some other things that it does for all us. All right, all right, great. Well, again, if you like more information about this little method and how to prepare this, we'll have that on the website. Check with your physician if you would like to do more research about it. But we certainly thank you, Sarah, for sharing thank this you. tasty but healthful treat made from elderberry. There's a lot of misinformation about snakes that live in our area, and we're going to get to meet one of our larger snakes here with Gary Harrington. Gary is the Chief Naturalist Director at Rum Village Nature Center Correct. in South Bend, Indiana, and you have a beautiful snake, right? I do. I have a beautiful fox snake. It's gorgeous. So it's a pretty big snake. He's probably four feet long. Four feet long. Okay. and. You know, sometimes people are familiar with garter snakes because they might get garter snakes in their garden. This is not a garter snake, right? It is not, okay. no. Okay, and how, how do we tell the difference? And how do we identify a fox snake? Fox snakes are uniformly tan colored with usually dark blotches. Sometimes it's darker than this, almost black. Yeah. But that's one way to tell them. Uh, if you happen to see the guy crawling away and you can see his underside, 
Yeah. Uh, he's pretty tan with black spots there as kind well. Kind of like a checkerboard almost, almost right? Like, like a checkerboard, these alternating yes. black, black and cream colored squares. Yeah. So really b beautiful. And of course, garter snake is sort of black with those like yellow or sometimes orange, just a thin stripe along the sides. Right. The most common one you'll see probably in your backyard. Right, right, this right. This guy, not so common. Not so common. Okay. All right. So it's a reptile. It is a reptile. All right. Yes. So what are some characteristics of snakes and reptiles? Um, that help us determine what, you know, what, what that classification of animals is. Right. For one characteristic is they'll be active until it starts turning cold. Yeah. And so then they will hibernate. We'll snow, see no reptiles or amphibians until springtime. Okay. So because they're, they're considered generically kind of cold-blooded, they will sleep uh, all throughout the winter months until springtime. And it's covered with scales. He's covered with scales, yes. And I'm always amazed. People often think snakes are slimy, but it's extremely dry and smooth, right? Yes, and that's one of the big misnomers about snakes. They're actually bumpy. And some yeah. kids say, yeah. oh, he feels like a basketball on the outside. That's yeah. because he has raised scales, and they are kind of bumpy. It, it, it does. That's a great analogy. It feels like a basketball. Yeah, that's great. Now, we, I happen to notice that on the head, this guy's peeling a little bit, and the color of the snake is pretty vibrant. I'm guessing it shed its skin recently, right? He has. That was probably about a week ago. He shed everything but the surface of his head there. Yeah. And that's why we can see that he's got uh, some residual scales there. Yeah. But that's one of the identifying factors about reptiles. They do shed their skin. Mm -hmm. Even turtles shed their skin, actually. As they grow, right? Yes. So it's part of their growth. It's a natural, natural thing. So what do fox snakes eat? So they are excellent rodent catchers. So they're actually beneficial to have around because they like to eat mice. And in this case, it'd have to be a small rat, but they eat, mm. eat mice and rats. So they help to keep the rodent population in check. So, so they, they do have an important role. They do, just like hawks and eagles, they help to keep rodent populations uh, in control. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Now, on, um, on a fox snake, uh, you said this one's about four feet long, so it's one of our longer or larger snakes in the area. But many times, I bet at Rum Village Nature Center, you get calls, people have seen a snake, found a snake, they can't identify it, they don't know what it is, and they panic and they automatically think it's venomous. They do. Unfortunately, they do. And the assumption should be uh, because we have only one kind of poisonous snake in northern Indiana. It's called a Massasauga rattlesnake. It's, it's uh, very rare. They're endangered. They live in wetland areas. Don't assume the worst when you see a snake. <laughs> it's not very common. No. And you, you actually brought a picture, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of see if I can hold this one up. Massasauga. It's, it's kind of similar blotchy, but this is gray. Right. And, and again, brown. Wetland species, so yeah. you're not going to find it in your backyard. You'd have to be slogging around in a wetland, right. most likely. I've looked for 20 some years, never <laughs> found one yet. Okay. Um, so you keep hoping, though, right? I, I keep hoping. Because <laughs> they are endangered. It's an they, endangered. They are endangered. Yep. And so if you don't like snakes very much and you see a snake and you're not sure, the best thing to do is just back off, give it some space. Um, don't panic and hurt it or kill it. Right. If you need some information, you can always call Rum Village Nature Center or the County Parks or yeah. Potato Creek. Yeah. And if you're fortunate enough to have your uh, cell with you and you can take a picture, you can send it to us and we'll be happy, happy to, to help. Happy ident to identify it. So one, one quick identifying feature of venomous snakes versus non-venomous snakes. We can look at this fox snake. We can kind of see its neck and its head are about the same size, right? Yes. Now, when it comes to venomous snakes, one of the things that they say is they have kind of a triangular-shaped head. Yeah. And this guy's head is just about the Blunt. same yep. same size as the rest of his body, yeah. actually. Yeah. Okay. And when you when it comes to their eyes, uh -huh. uh, the non-venomous ones have a round pupil. Right. The other ones have kind of an elliptical or kind of a long, uh, kind of thin pupil. Okay. Now, are you going to try to identify a snake? Go, getting close <laughs> enough to see. Uh, his eyeballs. No, that's not a good idea. Not a good idea. Um, you, the best thing to do, again, if you're far enough away and you want to take a picture and you feel safe doing that, you can do so. Mm -hmm. By all means, don't approach snakes if you don't feel good if about it. If you're not comfortable. No, if you're not comfortable. Just right. like any animal, uh, when in doubt, just leave it alone. Okay. All right. So that brings me to kind of uh, one more question about snakes. Obviously, this particular fox snake, you use it for educational programs at we Rum do. Village Nature Center with schools and the public. So this one in particular is used to being handled. Um, you know, sometimes people see the tongue and they panic. 
uh, what's it actually doing with its tongue? We should explain that. It's kind of weird. So I kind of explained to kids they kind of taste and smell at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's their sensory organ that tells them what's around. So they can kind of um, get an idea if there's an animal around, like maybe a rodent they want to eat, or if there's a person around, but it just gives them information about what's in their surroundings. So it's actually just checking out but it's the air, what's around it. Yep. Perfectly harmless. Yep. yep. Sometimes people think that the, that little pointy tongue is going to sting. And because you have this as an educational snake, uh, it, it sort of begs the question, do snakes make good pets? You know, there, snakes in the pet world are kind of high maintenance, I, I tell folks. Yeah. You can't go to the store and get um, uh, snake chow like you can dog chow or, <laughs> right. or, or cat chow. Yep. Uh, they, need, they have special needs. They have to be in the right kind of aquarium, the right kind of humidity, the right kind of temperature, the right kind of food, or they're not going to survive. So my recommendation is if you see one in the wild, leave it right where it is, take a picture, appreciate it, and let him live another day. All right, great. Well, listen, this is, it's been great to meet this beautiful, beautiful fox snake. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous reptile and very docile. And as you mentioned, a really great benefit in the ecosystem in helping us control rodents. So Absolutely. Gives us great appreciation for snakes. Yes. All right, thanks, Gary. Thank you. This beautiful shrub is a native wetland species and it's called winterberry. It's actually a native holly, so it's indigenous to the United States and it has these very leathery leaves, but unlike perhaps the Christmas holly that you might be familiar with that keeps its green leaves all winter long, winterberry actually drops its leaves, so it's a deciduous holly. That's, that's a little different. These berries here in early fall are just starting to get their bright scarlet color. In a few weeks, they will turn crimson red and all the leaves will fall off, making winterberry a very striking plant in the wetland. Some native plant nurseries also sell winterberry, so if you want to add it to your landscape, it's a great, great specimen. Hope you enjoy finding it in a wetland near you. I'm out here in this wetland at Cardinal Native Plant Nursery. The staff at Cardinal Native Plant Nursery comes out here to extract plants for wetland restoration projects. And when they do, they wear a suit just like this one. It protects them from the cold. Sometimes it's done in the early spring where it's very cold out here. Today we're going to meet some aquatic mammals that don't have wetsuits. They have their own adaptations so that they can thrive and survive out here in a wetland like this. I'm going to climb out of this wetland change out of my wetsuit and go talk to Barbara Tibbetts from Potato Creek State Park who's going to tell us more about those aquatic mammals. Well Barbara, I just came from a wetland. I was looking for some aquatic mammals there. I didn't see any, but I understand you're here to tell us about a few. What kind of aquatic mammals might we have a chance to see in our area? There are quite a few that are adapted to wetland areas. The smallest, one of the smallest, is the mink. So we've got uh, a mink pelt right here. We do. So. This is a fuzzy looking critter. It is. And this is the traditional animal of the mink coat. So yeah. look at this tiny creature and think how many of those would have been killed to make yeah. a single coat. It looks about about the shape and size of a ferret. I know people a lot of times have heard of ferrets. So uh, this is about that size. And I, I think, are they related? They are. They're yeah. in the weasel family. Excellent. Yeah. And so we've got the mink here. What other kinds of aquatic mammals might we see? Well, next up in size would probably be the muskrat. Muskrat. Looks like a big, cute mouse to me. Uh, <laughs> they are. They're yeah. members of the rodent family. And I think the thing for people to look for if they see a muskrat, in order to tell it from some of the other aquatic creatures, mm -hmm. is the tail. It has a vertically compressed tail rather okay, so than... So it's sort of flat like this, as opposed to flat like another animal we'll hear about later, which is flat in the other way, so Correct. it's flat like that. Yeah, straight All up right. and down. Okay. I also noticed these teeth here. It's got some, it looks like it's got some pretty good chompers there. It does have good chompers. It chews down vegetation both to eat and to construct its lodges out of. So it needs teeth that can take the uh, silica in okay. some of the things that it chews down and they're ever growing because the silica grinds the so teeth So they just down. keep growing if, yeah. they don't, if they're not chewing on yeah, something. Yeah, they have to chew something. And, and I understand they like cattails, right? It's one of their, their foods. I know a lot of our wetlands around here have a lot of cattails, so it wouldn't be too big of a surprise for us to see a muskrat out here. Yeah. So 
Now let's go on to one of the muskrat's bigger cousins. Let's take a look at this one here. What do we have? Well, this is the beaver. This is, believe it or not, a medium-sized beaver. They get pretty good size. And if you look, it has teeth that are pretty similar looking, anyway, to those of the muskrat. But as we all know, beaver chew on wood. And Got so it. they need the ever-growing teeth in order to cut down trees, to give themselves food, and to build their dams and lodges So they've as well. got some very strong teeth. You can see in this wood here, all these little teeth marks that are there. It looks like some chips around there. They've got to have some pretty powerful teeth to get through that stuff. When they chew on a tree like this, are they eating the wood or, or what are they doing with this, with this tree? When they chew on it and make this cone shape, they want that tree down mm -hmm. because they're going to eat the inner bark from some of the smaller branches. So they got want it. the juicy tidbits, but they also need big wood to construct with. Now, what are some of its adaptations that help it survive uh, out in uh, a wet environment? I think it's a most amazing adaptation is that like humans, this animal can construct its own environment. It can engineer it to create whatever it needs and it needs an aquatic environment because that's how it's adapted. So it will block running water. Running water is the enemy of a beaver, which causes us some problems when we manage wetlands. Sometimes they can be a little frustrating to people if they, <laughs> they build, build where they're not supposed to. They can, absolutely. But uh, once that wetland is there, a little pond or a lake, or even, even a river or stream, they're adapted for that. They have eyes with a nictitating membrane that closes over, so the eyelid is open, but the membrane protects the eye from floating debris. They have so when valves. they're down in the water, they're, eye, they're not running into sticks and damaging their eyes. And, and if they like are, that. it doesn't yeah. scratch the eyeball, yeah. And then their nose and ears have valves that close when they enter the water. And the weirdest thing, they sort of have two sets of lips, so they can carry a branch, but they can and have their mouth closed. Mouth. And, yeah, yeah that's, exactly. That's amazing. Yeah, and then the fur is, is awesome. They have castorium, which is an oil back by the, the butt, and they get that on a split claw. They comb it all through the guard hairs, which protects the inner fur, which keeps them warm. So they have two kinds of fur here. We've got, looks like there's a longer hair on the outside. The guard hairs. The guard hairs, and then these shorter, well, that, that's, that's looks that like under a really fur. plush carpet down yeah, there. It really yeah. is. So the guard hairs get waterproofed by the castorium, which keeps the under fur dry, which keeps the animal warm, even when swimming under ice in January. And so they're active in the winter months. Yeah, they're yeah. active, but they're mostly nocturnal. That's why we don't get to see them a lot. Got it just like all the aquatic animals. And so, of course, one of the adaptations that the beaver is most known for will be this tail back here. Yeah, the tail. And uh, we have another pelt here um, that shows the tail as well. And it's, what can you tell us about this tail? Well, unlike the muskrat, which tail went up and down, uh, the beaver tail is flat. Yeah, it's kind of hard to visualize a little bit, but there, there's kind of where the animal would be, so it would be flat this yes. way. It's flat so that when the beaver sits, like on the mount here, it has balance. Mm -hmm. The tail, it can press against the tree and the tail holds it. But most importantly, when it's on the water, it can smack, smack that tail the water. I've the heard surface. that. It can be a startling sound when mm -hmm. you're out in a kayak and you hear beaver slap Sounds the water like, a, like that. Sounds like a rifle shot. It's now, so I loud. I remember when I was a kid watching cartoons where the beaver was like making his home and slinging some mud around <laughs> and like patching up his home with us. I, I don't, they don't really do that, right? They do actually. They do that. Their tails are completely flexible yeah. when they're alive and they're well fed with blood vessels. They're warm to the touch. They can twist them, turn them, curl them and So they can do all them. kinds of things with Yes, they can. Excellent. Now this one uh, has a little bit, it, when it was processed, was uh, sewn up here. So if you mm -hmm. see a, a real beaver out in the wild, you're not going to see the, this sewing out on the edge of it, but <laughs> I think good. that one looks a little bit more accurate there. They also have some adaptations on their feet, and unfortunately, ours don't quite ha have that adaptation there because, you know, sometimes it happens with animals that are uh, taxidermy like this that some some things will kind of chew on them a little bit. Mm. If you see a beaver out in the wild that looks like this, uh, try to get a podiatrist because that's not the normal way <laughs> that's that not a good. Foot, what's a, a normal beaver foot supposed to look like? It looks like a duck foot. Okay. S toes are spread apart, there's webbing between, and that allows them to paddle very efficiently through the water, steering with that rudder tail back So there would be skin between all those toes that yeah. really help it go just yep. like a duck. And I think maybe, does our otter have a foot somewhat similar to that with a little bit of uh, skin there between the toes? Yeah, it so does. This is Excellent our swimmer. river otter, another uh, aquatic critter. A little less common perhaps than these others, but coming back in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So it's got those webbed feet. And this is more closely related to the, the mink, am I right? 
Yeah, it's a mustelid. A mustelid. It, it has scent glands that produce a nasty smell. Got it. And uh, it's sleek and long, it's tube shaped, and very playful in the water. They slide down banks and they, they roll with each other and they appear to be playing. Well, that'd be fun to see. I, um, hopefully, next time I'm in a wetland, I can have a chance to see one of these critters. I've never seen an otter in the wild, so I'd love to have a chance to see that. Barbara, thanks for coming out to tell us a little bit about some of these aquatic mammals. Next time I'm in a, a kayak or along the river somewhere, I'll make sure I, I'm looking for these things. Um, if you want to learn more about some aquatic mammals, you can visit the Outdoor Elements website. We've spent the day at Cardinal Native Plant Nursery in Walkerton, Indiana. We've seen some pretty interesting things today. We did. I loved that big, beautiful fox snake. That's so, a really cool so snake. So great to yeah. see. We spent time out in the wetlands and learned about aquatic mammals, about the muskrat and the beaver and the otters. And Sarah kind of talked us through the steps on how to make that elderberry syrup. I smell elderberry at home. I think I'm going to make some of that. I really was surprised at how good that tasted. It was pretty tasty. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.